Sam has education in literature, creative writing, and teaching, and she works as the night managing editor of a daily newspaper in Western Massachusetts. She's actually uh, ditching work right now to be with us, so don't tell anyone. Um, Sam is an active member of her local synagogue, Temple Israel of Greenfield, Massachusetts, where she recently celebrated an adult bat mitzvah with four other women. And she also serves as the youth coordinator in the local Hadassah chapter. And Sam is also a teacher and e-mentor for SOLA, the School of Leadership Afghanistan. Um, so Sam, we'd love to hear from you about the work you've been doing in Western Mass. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Etta, for this wonderful webinar. You always give great webinars. Um, this is a perfect, uh, Aaron set me up for a perfect uh, lead-in point. I uh, live in a community that didn't really have any teen education program as part of our Hebrew school. We were, uh, we had a small tight Hebrew school program that was happily uh, performing bar and bat mitzvahs. And then it seemed as though we had nothing to offer our students. And we had these bright and engaged young teenagers and it seemed like we had a vacuum. It was too quiet. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. So let me set the scene for you a little bit. It's rural Western Massachusetts. Um, so we have a very beautiful setting, not a lot of Jewish people, a lot of miles in between communities. And we had in our own synagogue, a situation where there was a, a sort of a vibrant adult community doing some adult ed stuff and a very separate feeling from the very young Hebrew school. With this program, we decided we wanted to try to draw kids together from different communities. So to draw from other synagogues who were also feeling like they didn't have this kind of education program and also kids who were unaffiliated. They, this was an experiment. So we had to be able to do standalone workshops, couldn't be dependent on repeat customers. We had no idea how many people we would get. Uh, we had to be willing to serve a, a broad age range. I'm guessing here 11 to 17 is about what we had. And some of these people had never been to regular services and had no Jewish education. So I wanted to make this appeal to everyone and I wanted it to have a social justice bent. So I was using the Living the Legacy curriculum throughout. My goals uh, were just to begin a teen social justice education program for a disparate Jewish community. Uh, we wanted to attract unaffiliated Jews. We have a lot of Jews in Western Mass who do not participate in a religious community in an organized way but they, um, they identify as Jewish and I knew we could draw on that community and engage them in an interesting way. And also in our synagogue, we were suffering from a lack of support from the synagogue board as a Hebrew school. So there was a, um, a split in our community. In some ways, some of the board members felt that the Hebrew school were, was drawing funds from the community. It was a sort of a money suck. The Hebrew school was getting smaller and there was this, um, a little bit of contention and I think this can happen in small communities where you're feeling the stress of a couple decades of declining funds or declining membership and I saw this as a really great opportunity to, to pull our kids together and also to to reinvigorate the whole community and uh, so we just launched it I said can I do this and they said yes um, the reason this happened is I had the wonderful opportunity of attending the Summer Institute with the JWA and it blew my mind um, the energy and motivation that I saw at the JWA with all the other educators in one room from all around the country made me realize that my own synagogue was disconnected in some ways from the excitement around contemporary Jewish education. And we had gotten a little bit narrow in our focus. And I was so excited to be with these people who were teaching in these different ways with these different communities. I wanted to bring that excitement home and also um, plug our community in more with what was going on with Judaism in Western Massachusetts and in New England, of course, between Boston and New York, you have some of the liveliest Jewish communities around. But I wanted to, I wanted to bring some of that energy back and connect it on the ground. We planned two workshops, only two during the whole year. The first one I called, what was the kosher meat boycott and what does it have to do with me? Um, uh, you know, pegging it for a teen audience. The second was, how did young people lead the drive for workers' rights? Um, these are both drawn from the labor 
part of the Living the Legacy curriculum. It was important to me that I start with a very simple format for these workshops, basic teaching principles. I would start by explaining vocabulary, uh, simple words like, what is a boycott? When you're, when you're dealing with 11 year olds, you're not sure what they know. And it, it always helps to define terms because we, we, we all dig into the words a little bit more and they come alive. We talked about the history and the daily life in the time with the kosher meat boycott, we're talking about the Lower East Side of 1902. So we talked a little bit about how do people communicate then? And this idea about daily postcards, the people sent postcards, mail was delivered twice a day, was that sort of the equivalent of our texting? And that, that became fascinating for me. And kids got really into that, dealing with well, what was daily life like. Then the wonderful thing about the living the legacy curriculum is that there are a lot of activities. You want to get the kids out of their chairs, get their brains moving, their oxygen flowing. So I, it, it's really important to me to use different activities throughout the learning sessions and always have some time for Torah study. This seemed seamless. It, it worked perfectly with the, what the kids were interested in. And I timed it in such a way so that they'd been out of their seats. They got a snack. I brought out the chocolate and we studied some Torah. I think in both sessions I taught, I had kids who were not even Jewish, who wanted to come because they were interested in history and social justice and um, had some open-minded parents. And they were, it, it just went seamlessly. They understood the ethics. They were really excited to talk about ethics. I can't tell you how excited these kids were to talk about ethics. I think it's um, a really untapped area in teen education because the kids are really, they have such a strong sense of justice that it's just, it's great when you, when you treat them with respect and then they want to say something. And then I was constantly encouraging the students to connect to contemporary social justice issues. So we talked about, um, you know, pricing with the kosher meat boycott. You're talking about consumer control, pricing, the power of uh, women to take something in the business world and take control over it because it meant so much to them and they had control of their household economy. And the kids were immediately able to come up with examples from contemporary life. So that was great. We talked about organizing tools and social media and I can get into that a little bit later. Um, that's become a really important part of talking about social justice in a contemporary context, the communication tools we use. And here we are online and we're doing it now. And I think it's, it's great to, to use these tools and to encourage young people to use these tools in a really responsible and exciting way. Okay, Ed, thank you, you can move on. So we started with the kosher meat boycott, we defined terms, we discussed life in the Lower East Side. Um, I introduced activities, something I called the labor train, where uh, we explored the supply and demand while the kids were marching around the room. How do you make the train go? How, what makes the train stop? How does this uh, describe worker power? I use something I call the word association map, which is an exercise right out of living the legacy. We put all these different pieces of paper on the floor with different keywords and people move around the room and write their word associations on these sheets of paper. It works. It's a very simple exercise. People move, people think. It's fun. And then we had a student focused discussion of contemporary issues that were worrying them and that they would like to change. And this is where the really engage initiate, engage sequence part of the social justice platform it becomes exciting for me. Um, the kosher meat boycott happened, um, I think, right around the time of the Newtown school shooting in Connecticut. And that came up when we had this part of the discussion. And kids wanted to talk about how can they control these issues if they feel powerless. What, you know, what is, we talked about it from a consumer standpoint about guns and also how do kids get their voices heard in matters that really concern them? And they were serious. It was great. It was a really great discussion. In the second workshop we did this spring, how did young people lead the drive for workers' rights? I started with a favorite quote of mine from the Declaration of Independence about people being willing to suffer while ills are sufferable and that only at a certain point will people stand up and actually fight for their rights to improve their lives. And then we began to talk about the workers during the garment industry. There was to me a direct tie from the kosher meat boycott to the garment strikes that these young people who formed the strikes in the garment industry 
had learned from the example seven years before from the kosher meat boycott, and I find that very interesting and exciting. We used activities that involved photo analysis of this era with using primary sources. They loved talking about the photos, moving the photo. They shared photos around the room. They were discussing them, trying to figure out how to read them, what was going on in the photos. I had adults join this workshop because they were so excited about it. They wanted to be part of it. Um, one of our students stood up and gave Clara Lemlich's speech. She stood on a chair. Um, there's always a Clara in the class, if not more than one. That was a lot of fun. I had, um, with this one, we had a lot more community involvement. One of our community members brought in postcards from the era and examples of sewing that were done in that era. I invited two of the local labor organizers, uh, David Cohen and Judy Atkins, came and spoke about working as labor organizers in Western Massachusetts factories. And I'm uh, very fortunate to have the Wholesale Klezmer Band on hand as part of our community. And Joe Curlin came and taught us Arbiter Freuen. So we sang a labor song. Moving on. Outcomes so far. So we went from having no teen social justice um, programming, no teen Jewish education program in our community. Um, so far we have, there was a huge jump in the participation from the first to the second. There were eight kids that showed up. For the first one, we had more than 21 people show up, a mix of teens and adults but I think at least 15 of them were teens. And the kids have been asking for more workshops since approaching the adults in the community saying, when are we gonna do that again? When is the next one? That's the most exciting feedback for me. The whole community has responded very positively. The people who were invited to participate want to come back and talk to the students more. And there's just been a, sort of an outpouring of support for this to the point where the synagogue president is now asking me to plan a whole course for the next year. She wants to allocate money for the budget and she was heavily promoting this up and down our region in Western Mass to invite people from other synagogues to join us. And I've seen area teens begin to use social media more for social justice. One of our community members formed a petition about an issue that is really important to her and she was promoting it on Facebook. And one of her Hebrew teachers didn't even realize that she had initiated this petition. And then she found out and I, she was very excited about that. And I think that using social media, using Twitter, using Facebook in a responsible way, in a very active and lively way is great. We can model that and our students can pick it up and they, then we will learn from them. So I've been really excited about the outcome just from this two workshop experiment. And I could not have done it without living the legacy. It never would have happened if I hadn't gone to study with the Jewish Women's Archive. Thanks, Sam. I think I put I put some pictures that Sam sent me in here so we can just go through them and you guys can get a glimpse into the programs that she put together. Um, so I'll scroll through and you can just tell us what, what we're looking at, Sam. Thank you, Esa. So this is the the um, the word collage, the word map on the floor where students go around and they do word association. It's part of the labor curriculum. Um, and Marilyn Heiss also did this activity. She presented a webinar yesterday and she has some more student work examples from this activity if you would like to look at them on our site. Excellent. I wish I could see Marilyn teach. I know she's on the West Coast. She's brilliant. These were kids participating in what we called the labor train. How do you keep the train moving? Production of goods, selling goods, and what makes them, what makes the train grind to a halt? This is our Clara <laughs> giving her speech at Cooper Union. This is a, a student strike where the students during the workshop, I said, can you show me what an example of a strike would look like? And they decided to stop participating in the workshop and they all got up and they went and they stood on one side of the room. It was great. I, I was sort of like, this is perfect. And they... This was an example of a piece that was created during the, the period of garment working that is described in the labor curriculum. And it was a, a sample piece that had been handed down through this woman's family. And she's a member of our congregation. And she happened to have it and brought it to our workshop. That was really exciting. And this is Joe Curlin teaching a Yiddish work song. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Sam, um, for sharing that with us. Does anyone have questions for Sam? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. First of all, I'm just like blown away. I'm really impressed with the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could describe the labor train activity with a little more detail. I think I, I wasn't really clear on what that is. So it was literally kids standing up and I asked them, what would you need to keep the train moving? So I, if you might've seen in one of the photos, somebody was holding a colander and I had put a bunch of chocolate in the colander and they were using chocolate as their currency, little chocolates. And they needed to continue the flow of the currency. So they would put chocolate in the colander to make it go. And then they would work and they would get paid and I would pay them with chocolate. And if they, at one point, somebody stopped working because I wasn't paying her enough. And then the production stopped. And when the production stopped, they were making, I don't know, shoes or something. And it was all imaginary. But when she decided to stop working because I wasn't paying her enough chocolate, the train stopped. So I had to pay the workers to keep the train going. And then we had consumers who had to buy the shoes. They also helped to keep the train going. So it was all very metaphorical, but also physical. And they really got it. They actually introduced some, some uh, behaviors I hadn't anticipated to test how it worked. It was very simple very simple mathematical model with a physical component and it was fun. Great, great question, Jessica. Um, Faggy's asking a question here what about what the ages were of the kids, the teens who were involved in the programs. So this was wide open and we ended up with an 11 year old who you can see I think right now in her red cape and a 17 year old. And some of these kids knew each other, some of them did not. It worked really well. The questions were intelligent. The students helped each other answer them. It, it just, I couldn't believe how cooperative it worked. 